It's not bad. OK, so I'm, I'm going to assume that if you're here, you, you saw the introductory talk that I gave. Um, so, uh, true. what? Not completely true. But Not completely true. Yeah. So the the um, uh, the basic thing that I want you to keep in mind from that introduc introductory talk is this idea that uh, Ted Jacobson's argument tells us that we shouldn't be thinking of space time as a quantum fluctuating variable, but rather as sort of a hydrodynamic average in general. And we know from condensed matter physics how sometimes that can lead to regimes where you do quantize hydrodynamics, and I'm not going to go over that. What you'll see in the basic formalism that I'm going to outline is that that idea that space-time doesn't quantum fluctuate is just built into the formalism. The formalism has in it um, a dependence on the space-time background. And the way to think about that is to say, if Einstein's equations are hydrodynamics, then you give me a solution, and I want to find a quantum system whose hydrodynamics reproduces that flow. That's, that's the basic idea. So um, when we, yeah. So, so if we think of hydrodynamics uh, in describing Motion of you know all the conglomerate of atoms or whatever molecules. And so you know at the fundamental level we do have a fluctuating substance. You know it's, it satisfies a Schrödinger equation. Right. And what you're saying is we're not putting in independently fluctuating variables or something like that. No, the the, the thing we call the gravitational field. Yeah. Okay. Well, sort of it's like a collective hydrodynamic flow variable. Yeah. Which only gets quantized in very special situations. Yeah. Well, okay. So you're, I think, saying, well, we're not putting in an independent set of degrees of freedom for that. Is That's that right. Sense? Absolutely. So those Basically. degrees of freedom are embedded, as you'll see, in the definition of the quantum mechanics of the real degrees of freedom. Okay. So um, the the basic idea. Following that is to start um, where I did last time, thinking about um, the infinite causal diamond that's the boundary of Minkowski space, and kind of thinking about, OK, we want to talk about local physics. There should be some local version of that, a local causal diamond. And of course, given a space-time background, I know precisely how to talk about local causal diamonds. Um, and now what we're going to do is translate what I told you last time into ideas about quantum mechanics. So the fundamental idea is that if I have a causal diamond, it's got some proper time along some geodesic, OK? And along some time-like path, in fact. Um, we, Since I'm going to be starting out talking about things that are Minkowski space, I will take that path to be some time-like geodesic in Minkowski space. Um, and there, it's characterized by two things, its proper time and the area of its holographic screen. And the area of the holographic screen, according to the holographic principle, tells us what the dimension of the Hilbert space that you associate with that diamond is. OK? So the set of things you just said are sort of taken as postulates. These are postulates. Structure. That's right. This is fundamental structure. So I'm not, I'm not trying to derive these from someplace. I'm saying this is what the holographic principle says to me. And I'm going to see where I can get from that basic idea. So as Thomas Hertog said to me yesterday afternoon, if you've got the causal diamond at infinity, you know exactly what you're talking about. But if you just talk about some causal diamond somewhere, where is it? How do you, how do you define where it is? Well, and the basic, yeah? The, the error is meant to be the error of that right-hand vertex. 
Well, in the in Minkowski space, this uh, oh, maximal scary. surface is the holographic screen. In some other background, it might be someplace else. Oh, okay. But in, in general, the area depends on the space-time background. And the basic idea is to take that information from the hydrodynamics and to put it into the quantum theory. According to this principle of Jacobson's that if you make that postulate about the quantum theory, then you get Einstein's equations out as the hydrodynamics. That, that's the basic idea. So we've got a proper time. We've got an area. One of the interesting things about Jacobson's uh, derivation is that he doesn't get the cosmological constant. The way he gets Einstein's equations is by looking at any point at some infinitely accelerated unroot trajectory going right past that point and in the limit hugging the light cone of that point. And so what he always gets is the dot product of k mu k nu into the Einstein tensor equals k mu k nu dotted into t mu nu with an 8 pi g. And um, that doesn't pick up the cosmological constant. If there's a term in here, I'm going to tell you this is not quite the right place to think of it as, but if there's a term in here proportional to the cosmological constant, it vanishes on every null vector k. And this, I claim, is a bug, a feature, not a bug. Okay, And the reason that it's a feature, not a bug, is that uh, one of the places that Fischler and I started thinking about this is thinking about the cosmological constant not as some local contribution to the energy density, but as a boundary condition on the relationship between area and proper time when one or another of them goes to infinity. So if I take the maximally symmetric space times or anything that's close to them with positive, negative, and zero cosmological constant, then there are three different kinds of asymptotics. For positive cosmological constant, A of t goes to something finite as t goes to infinity. For negative cosmological constant, A goes to infinity at finite t. And that's, so anti-de-sitter space, if you have a big enough causal diamond in proper time, it looks like this. And it hits the boundary, and it's including for sure an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And that's the realm of ADS-CFT. ADS-CFT talks about propagation along that time-like part of the boundary. That's what the time in ADS-CFT is. And then finally, if lambda equals 0, then A goes like t to the d minus 2 in Minkowski space. So we think of the cosmological constant not as something in the Hamiltonian, but on, in the boundary conditions that determine what the maximal Hilbert space is and how we should think of the Hilbert spaces of local causal diamonds being embedded in that for different amounts of proper time. Okay? So what we're going to do is define quantum mechanics along a time-like trajectory. Now, let me come back to this point of Thomas's that um, you know, when I say I have a causal diamond of a certain area, that doesn't tell me too much about the causal diamond. And the answer to that in a word that, that Steve and Don like a lot is relational, okay? Namely, if I've got two causal diamonds, then they've got an intersection. Might be empty, might be that one is entirely included in the other, or there might be some non-inclusive intersection. 
In quantum field theory, what we say about a situation like that is that inside this intersection region, which despite the two-dimensional picture is not itself a causal diamond, there is a causal diamond, a maximal area that fits inside of that. And there is an operator algebra that lives in that causal diamond of maximal area. And if I look at the operator algebra that lives in this bigger causal diamond or this bigger causal diamond, this operator algebra commutes with big pieces of this. Now, in quantum field theory, operator algebras, even for any region, no matter how small, of space-time are always infinite dimensional. That's part of the UV problem. That is the UV problem of quantum field theory. No matter how small the region is, the theory becomes conformally invariant, and there are an infinite number of degrees of freedom in an arbitrarily small region. Quantum gravity, according to the holographic principle, cuts that off. And that makes this um, commutation algebra story that I just told you directly into a Hilbert space story. In infinite dimensional operator algebras, if you say there's a subalgebra that commutes with a whole bunch of other stuff, there's a whole long story that Murray and von Neumann went through, and it depends what kind of operator algebra it is, what the definition of convergence is, and so on. And you can't, in general, talk about things being tensor products. And this is something we understand very well because people who like to compute entanglement entropy, if you compute in quantum field theory in any reasonable state close to the vacuum, the entanglement entropy of this causal diamond with stuff that's outside you find that it diverges because there's stuff arbitrarily close to the horizon of the diamond, which um, is very highly entangled, has very large commutators with the stuff just on the other side. This is the singularity of commutators in quantum field theory on the light curve. So tensor factoring the Hilbert space in quantum field theory is a very, very mathematically difficult idea, once I've Im imposed the holographic principle, all of these Hilbert spaces are finite dimensional. And then commutation of operator algebras just means this algebra is a tensor factor in the bigger algebra here. It's a tensor factor here. And that's equivalent to saying that the Hilbert spaces of this and this factorize both of them, and they have a common tensor factor, which has a dimension that I know given the area of this diamond. So, so okay, so the stroke of a pen, you banish type three, basically, or? I banished everything except type one, one sub n. Yeah, finally. Uh, and so then I guess, you know, ultimately the big question will be how to reconcile that, and, and that's why I've been bugging you about related questions, with uh, sort of Lorentz invariance, which, at some level tells you. It's because Lorentz invariance is an asymptotic symmetry. Yeah, it's not yeah. a symmetry of a local causal diamond. Yeah. So, get to that, but, yeah. we'll get to that, indeed. <clears throat> so, um, the, uh, the, the story then is to try to set up, you give me a space time, I then try to set up a rich enough set of causal diamonds in which I can impose all of these relations and now start to do quantum mechanics in these Hilbert spaces. Now, the most um, interesting first step is to look at causal diamonds that are related in this way, in a nested fashion. So this, what this corresponds to I'm drawing a picture that's appropriate for thinking about time symmetric space times. I've got some time like trajectory, which for Minkowski space I'm going to think of as some time like geodesic. And it's got a point of time symmetry. Okay? And so I take it to run from minus t to t. And then at shorter intervals around zero, 
there are smaller causal diamonds which should be embedded in the Hilbert space of the big causal diamond, okay, in a, um, in a fashion such that this is a tensor factor in that, and this is a tensor factor in that, and this is a tensor factor in that, and so on. And then in general, okay, what you expect if I'm doing Minkowski space for sure, if I increase the proper time, then the area increases like t to the d minus 2. And so these, if I take a larger proper time, I have a bigger area, and so they're always proper tensor factors. In the case of de Sitter space, where I'm going to end up with a, um, a finite area um, at infinite time, what effectively happens is that at a certain roughly finite time, you fill up the whole Hilbert space, and then you have to let proper time run off to infinity operating in the, the whole Hilbert space. I mean, Hilbert spaces uh, can't, you know, in, in, when, when you do continuous evolution of areas, you can have an area asymptotically approach a finite number, but if things are jumping by at least a factor of two each time, okay, and the smallest thing I can tensor in is a two-dimensional Hilbert space, then that's discrete. And so I would reach that in a finite amount of time. And so then you think of time going on, but in the fixed finite dimensional Hilbert space of de Sitter space. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the basic picture of how this, this is all supposed to work. what should be an answer to Thomas's question, and I missed it. But you mentioned these words. I didn't state it yet. You didn't state it yet. Okay, then I'll wait. Okay. So now there's something that follows from this picture. I now want to put in something else, something that we know from quantum field theory, and I'm going to try to keep that. And it's the only thing that's consistent with the picture as I've just described it to you. If the time evolution from here to here in this causal diamond mixes up the operators in here with operators that commute with them, then there won't be any sense in which this region has only this operator algebra. So it must be that the time evolution over some little interval of time, splits up into two pieces. There's the time evolution inside the causal diamond, okay, and the time evolution outside the causal diamond at that given time. And as the time, the proper time interval you're looking at gets bigger, one of those Hamiltonian operators starts to act on more and more degrees of freedom, and the other one on fewer and fewer, assuming the total is finite, okay? In, a, in any infinite dimensional situation, like flat space or ADS, what I would do is take a proper time just before you get to the infinite area diamond, do everything up to that limit, and then um, take the limit carefully, okay? So I'm always sort of able to split up H in and H out in the appropriate way um, because I know I, I'm only dealing with a finite dimensional Hilbert space at each time. So what this tells me is that the Hamiltonian H of T, let's call it H of little t, I'll reserve big T for the, the big time that I keep the whole Hilbert space in. It's always h in of t plus h out of t. And these things are changing with time. Okay, They can't possibly not change with time. Now, if you want to think in quantum field theory language, what you should sort of think about is that I've taken the stress tensor in this region. I've dotted it into a set of time-like geodesics that are sort of parallel to this um, 
this particular time-like geodesic, and I've integrated it, but only over the indicated amounts of time at each time. Now, if you actually try to implement that picture in quantum field theory, it's an absolute disaster because of these boundary divergences. Okay, and there are also all kinds of ambiguities about choices of surface and so on. For us, it's going to be easy. Again, because we're dealing with finite things, and um, in particular, I, there is one symmetry that I'm absolutely going to preserve, which is the rotation invariance around a particular time-like trajectory, and that'll be the guide to tell me how how to uh, fix things up. And then that also leads to a way to think about how to do stuff even when you don't have rotation invariance. This division of the Hamiltonian into the inside and outside part, that's exact. Absolutely, totally exact. Okay? So the Hamiltonian, we're, we're really going to be doing discrete time evolution with these Hamiltonians. H of little t is the thing that goes between uh, little t plus 1. I'll tell you what 1 means and little t. Okay. And I'm actually acting with the unitary e to the minus i h of little t rather than doing something infinitesimal. And again, the reason for that is that because these changes are changes in the dimension of the Hilbert space, and so they have to happen at discrete times. You could, if you wanted to, fill that in with some continuous time dependence in these little intervals. It'll turn out that in order to keep rotation invariance, these little intervals have to be Planck scale. So if you want to talk about time shorter than the Planck scale and have a continuous time evolution, you're perfectly allowed to do so as long as your time evolution at my discrete times agrees with my discrete time evolution. So. What should I think of as, evol as evolving? Do you like a Heisenberg picture or a Schrodinger picture type thing? And this is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Yes, but what okay. would so this is the with this is hitting states. This is the Schrodinger Hamiltonian. Okay. And, and it maps states from where to where? Okay. So it maps states from the past boundary of this diamond uh -huh. to the past boundary of the next diamond. Okay. When I'm doing that, H in is shrinking, H out is getting bigger. Okay. And uh, similarly, when I go forward, because I'm choosing to study a time symmetric space time, H of little t will be equal to H of minus little t. So that's another symmetry that I put in. And then in, in that evolution, I'll go to a larger Hilbert space when I go for H in and a smaller one for H out. So, so because of time symmetry, I'm discussing both evolution from the past boundary to the past boundary and from the future boundary to the future. So boundary. H in maps past to past, H out is future to future. No, no, no. It's H in maps past to past, H out maps past to past at minus t, minus little t, okay. and H in and H out map future to future at plus little t. So what again was the difference between H in and H out? The H in acts is built up only out of operators in this operator algebra. And H out is built up of things in the commutant of that operator algebra in the full algebra of the maximal causal diagram. But H out still acts non-trivially on the states from the, from the past boundary of that smaller diamond? No. OK, good. It acts, it acts on. Everything that's not that's in the maximal diamond you ever get to, that commutes with what's in the smaller diamond. Okay. I see. So this full operator H is always acting on on the, the whole Hilbert, Hilbert space. space. There's no violation of unitarity. There's it's standard time-dependent quantum mechanics. It's as if I took a lattice theory and said, oh, I'm only going to couple together the first 15 spins for the first 15 minutes, and then the next 30 spins, you know, and so on. 
like that. I have a question about the rotation of the variance. Yeah. That's relative to a particular time-like direction. Right. But I assume that you're not trying to construct a theory that has a preferred Absolutely not. Direction Absolutely not. I haven't talked about that yet. So, but the problem is, that, so if I, if I require rotation of variance with respect to all time-like directions, that's a lot of requirement. And yes. it seems hard to see how it's going to fit together. The Hilbert space that's finite dimensional for this time-like direction has to overlap with the one that's finite for this time direction. So the solution to that is they're completely different Hilbert spaces. Okay. There is a different t entire Hilbert space for each time-like trajectory in spacetime. Okay. And I was about to say that. But um, so this is, um, this is this is a very different way of satisfying the principle of relativity than the one we're used to in quantum field theory, but I believe that it does. And let, let me now get to that. I think, I believe I've, I've gotten up to that. So now we have the, the, the following situation. So let's look at some particular causal diamond along trajectory one. Let's call it curly T1 for trajectory. And now I've got another causal diamond along trajectory two that has an intersection with it. So my prescription up till now has been I take trajectory one and I take trajectory two and I give them independent quantum mechanical systems. Okay. But, but there's this overlap. So how do I talk about this overlap? Well, I know how to talk about this overlap in here, and I know how to talk about this overlap in here, and this overlap corresponds to a tensor factor in each of these two Hilbert spaces. These two Hilbert spaces might not have the same dimension, but this tensor factor is supposed to have the same dimension. Okay? So I have to tell you, I give you the dynamics along here, I give you the dynamics along here, I give you the initial state here, and the initial state here, two different quantum mechanical problems. And now I say in here, in this tensor factor, some particular one that I have to find in order to satisfy what are going to be a very difficult set of consistency conditions, as you said, there's a density matrix. Because the state in this Hilbert space has been acted on by the Hamiltonian acting on all the variables. So what's in here is entangled with what's outside. Okay. And the state of the variables in this intersection are in some density matrix. Okay. The initial pure state, I can always take initial states to be pure. I'm not violating the rules of quantum mechanics. So I can tell you what the evolution of any incoming density matrix is if I tell you the evolution of all pure states. Mm -hmm. So I start out with pure states. I evolve my pure state, and I get some density matrix for this tensor factor. And then I do the same thing over in this other quantum mechanical system over here, and I get a different density matrix for this tensor factor that I want to identify. And so for every pair of trajectories at every time, okay, I get a set of conditions that say that the density matrix on the overlap according to trajectory one is equal to U dagger, which depends on one, two, and the time row of two on the overlap. The way you're talking about this, it's like local quantum field theory, that once you have a region, you know what your tensor factor is. But given that your dimension of the Hilbert space is finite, it must be that those finite number of degrees of freedom are kind of non-locally associated with a given causal diamond. So there, there's How do I decide which ones are the ones in the overlap? by insisting that these consistency conditions are satisfied. 
So I give you some basis of the Hilbert space here, described in a way that I'll be telling you about, and the basis of the Hilbert space over here. I give you an evolution operator. That tells me what the density matrix is in whatever basis I chose in the two different Hilbert spaces. So if I very slowly move the right diamond a little bit to the right gradually, do I sort of get to some critical point where I pop into a lower dimension of the overlap? And what oh, no. That point? Absolutely. That's the thing that tells you how far apart those trajectories are in space at that time. Okay. This is the thing that's going to tell us okay, how to get the geometry out of the quantum mechanics. Okay. So, so in field theory, the analog density matrix would be something like the Riddler density matrix, where you take the Minkowski vacuum. Well, it's much more complicated than that because I'm insisting on a finite region. The Riddler density matrix is everywhere. Well, you can do something similar for. Uh, you can do something similar. It doesn't, you know, it it just doesn't uh, look. It, the same for multiple reasons, one of them being the UV divergences, and number two being that the simple Rindler formula is really only true for something that accelerates for an infinite amount of time. So a Rindler observer for us in a given diamond will be something that has some trajectory that goes through that particular diamond um, like this. and um, I don't care what it does outside, okay? So it's very hard to write down an analog of this in field theory, mostly because of the divergences, but also because it's clumsy. It's a clumsy thing in field theory. So it's like these really integrals that I told you about. And it's because yeah. field theory describes everything in this completely global way, and we're describing it here in a much more local way. That's why I'm asking, though, is because what you're doing different is introducing some finiteness that regulates this, or, you know, cuts off those divergences. Well, not just that. What it's doing exactly. Not, not just that. So the other thing that we're doing is insisting on doing quantum mechanics over and over again, independently in different Hilbert spaces, which at finite times only have overlaps, and I only compare whether density matrices are unitarily equivalent. Okay, whereas in field theory, you've always got one big Hilbert space that everything sits in. Now, in many cases, we'll try to argue from this formalism that when you take time going to infinity, you end up with one big Hilbert space. But in field theory, we do computations in a state that's defined globally with correlations between every two points in spacetime. Here, there's no such thing. Okay, at any given time, this Hamiltonian, which is not something to be compared to a field theory Hamiltonian on a time slice, and it's not to be compared to the ADS Hamiltonians on the boundary, it's, it's a different thing, and there are many of them, and they're all time dependent. So they're not any of the Hamiltonian operators you're used to that form parts of symmetry groups. They will parts of them will converge to those generators in appropriate limits. Yes, Alex? Uh, suppose you take one diamond, uh, you know the dimension of the Hilbert space, it's uh, defined by the length of the circle. Right. Uh, you intersect it with another diamond. Right. And uh, according to your rule, uh, the Hilbert space splits into two factors. One that belongs to the intersection, the other uh, commutes with it. Right. Uh, what are the dimensions? Uh, do we have, uh, the dimensions are determined in the following way. You look at the geometry, whatever your geometry happens to be. You look at that intersection region in space-time. There is a maximal area, causal diamond, that fits into that region. So in your 2 plus 1 dimensional case, that maximal length on the boundary of the causal diamond. That determines the dimension of the Hilbert space by the um, area formula. I really feel I'm uncomfortable about the following thing. When you say a maximal area diamond, yeah. so how would I define that? I would look at the, the metric and I would vary over surfaces and for each surface evaluate 
the area, right? The problem is, you just told me a second ago that the metric is extracted from something about this discrete Hilbert spaces and the quantum state. So, so it seems like I can't, it's circular. I don't know how to. Okay, so we're, we're it's, not, it's not circular for the following reason. I'm using, following your paper, I'm using a specific space time as a guide to construct a quantum system. After the quantum system is constructed, I step back and I say, just a moment. Suppose someone gave me this infinite set of quantum systems with all of these overlap relations satisfying these consistency conditions. I could now extract from that quantum system a space-time metric, and because the quantum system satisfies the area law, it's built in, your paper tells me, oh, that metric is going to satisfy the Einstein there equation. There should be some way to state the whole construction without reference to that yeah, I, metric. Yeah, I, I always used to do that when I presented this stuff. I used to start saying, okay, we've got Hilbert spaces and tensor factors, and it just blew everybody away. Nobody could understand a word I was saying. So I could present it that way, but I've had so many people complain to me about it that I don't. Okay, but it could be presented that way completely. Well, along those lines, I mean, <coughs> maybe I should wait a bit. But you're going to, the, the structure will have a lot of this richness. You'll have areas of causal diamonds. You'll have overlaps. How, you, you can't read off the, the reference metric from all that information. You can. Okay, so there's a theorem. Right. Uh, Exactly. If I give you two metrics that have the same causal structure and the same conformal factor, they're the same. Right. Okay, so the two two metrics that have the same causal structure are related by a conformal factor. If I give you the conformal factor, I know the metric completely. Right. So how does this information tell me this? If I tell you for a rich enough set of diamonds, for example, for the diamonds associated with a Planck-spaced set of time-like geodesics in Minkowski space, um, if I gave you all of the causal information by telling you all of these overlaps, which is purely quantum mechanical information here, it has to do with commutation of operator algebras and what the density matrix is and so on. If I gave you that information, I'd know the causal structure of the metric, and that's why it, it tells me things about how far apart things are. And, well, I, I need the area part to tell me how far apart things that are, but the area gives me the conformal factor. But then some, some hydrodynamic thing that changes, that's not just a change in the conformal factor, formation of a black hole or something. That, okay. So if I'm talking about a complicated quantum system that I form in the interior of Minkowski space, yeah. there will be two different languages to talk about it in. In language number one, I'll just use the causal structure of Minkowski space and all of these relations, and that object will be some kind of excitation in the model. Okay? Language number two, I can say, oh, this is such a big complicated excitation that I just want to see its hydrodynamic description, and that'll be a metric. And then you'll build a new set of diamonds on no, the metric. No, 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 no. The underlying fundamental theory lives in Minkowski space. But you couldn't build a, a new structure on a special geometry or something? Um, it's I, irritating. I, I find that very confusing. And I claim it's not what you want to do if you want to understand black hole evaporation because the Schwarzschild geometry is just completely the wrong thing for black hole evaporation. The real black hole is, is something that has a time-like cylinder as its boundary rather than these null surfaces. And, and that time-like cylinder shrinks in space as time goes on as the black hole evaporates. That's what we want the quantum system to look like eventually if we're going to describe black hole evaporation. So trying to shove the Schwarzschild metric in there seems to me just the wrong thing to do. Very good. Yeah. 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 So it has to be, you know, you have to have more than half the system in there. 
right? Page's theorem. If the, if the state is generic in the big diamonds, yeah. which it has no reason not to be, yeah. then you have to have more than half the system in here before this density matrix has any information in it whatsoever. Now, that's not the whole story, okay? That's not the whole story because of the fact that um, what we're going to come to is that there's this split of degrees of freedom mm -hmm. into things that I can think of as local excitations and things that always live on, on the boundaries of the causal diamond. And for those things that are local, you can track where they are much better and think about their state in a much more um, uh, uh, well-defined way because of the fact that what, what will distinguish local degrees of freedom from other degrees of freedom is that they don't interact with most of the degrees of freedom in their own boundary, even though they're causally connected to them. Okay. I might have been asking a different question. I'm not sure. Let me rephrase my question. If that overlap region, according to this reference metric, has a you know, maximal area of 20 Planck units, Right. Is there really something that the observers can, you know, measure and compare that sees that overlap, or should I only think about that overlap as being? Is there really a tensor factor in the Hilbert space in that case, or do I only know there's a tensor factor if the overlap is large compared to the Planck scale? I would say in the mathematical formalism, there's always an overlap. Okay. No matter how small it is, as long as it's bigger than one Planck area, or maybe slightly bigger than that. You'll see there are some finite factors. But. So if I imagine that I had one of these diamonds here and another set of the diamonds that was spaced kind of equally around them, each with a few Planck units overlap, right? Right. It, it seems like you know, because the theory is holographic and the entry is set by the area, that those each of the assuming that let's see, can't I set this up such that I have a large number of the overlap regions, each space like different from each other, and therefore presumably a separate tensor factor, and such that the dimensions must add up to the dimension of the Hilbert space of your center. You're trying to prove that it, there has to be volume entropy in the story. Well, something like that. I mean, I, 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 I'm okay. I think I think the answer I think the answer is no, and and part of it is that that they're diamonds rather than. So you have you have information about yeah, what's on the holographic the screen on. The, if I make these diamonds all time symmetric and look at t equals zero slides. I think we should we should talk about it in more detail because I'm not completely catching what your setup is. Yeah, and I, I'm I, wondering if there's really anything in the interior diamond or just in the, the big one on the outside. Um, you know, that's something that you have to specify. In some of our models, we have trajectories that are separated in space by a Planck unit. The overlaps are very large. And then as they go further and further away from each other at fixed time, the overlaps get smaller and smaller. And they go to zero only at a time when the distance in the metric yeah. is such that they're causally separated. Okay. So there, there may be, you know, Planck scale ambiguities in what I just said. I would, you know, that that's perfectly possible. Okay. Oh, I have so. one question. Of, sorry about this. Uh, you were saying that if we take these two uh, two regions and they have some overlap, that the size of the Hilbert space is given by the largest causal diamond that fits in there. It's not that we have to sort of tile the overlap with causal diamonds. It's just the. I mean, it seems like that could be a very that could be quite a small causal diamond, right? And despite having a very large overlap region. Yeah. Yeah. That's our rule is I it, it it again, it's possible that thinking more generally about regions and light sheets and so on, that you might be able to define something else that looked like a Hilbert space. The thing I know is I know how to talk about the causal complement of, of a causal diamond and how to talk about what the entropy is that I should associate with that. And it, it, it's just simpler only to think about that. I, 
it might be that there are other tensor factors that I could associate with non-causal diamond regions, and we have not thought about them. Okay. All right, so I think it's time to um, talk about what the variables are that this quantum system is made up of. So in my previous talk, I told you this story about talking about scattering theory in Minkowski space in terms of currents that go out to infinity, carrying various kinds of quantum numbers. And we talked about the BMS currents. And I claim that the right way to think about those is actually to think about the spectrum of the BMS currents as defining the asymptotic boundaries of space-time. So the BMS current is something that's local to a point on the sphere at null infinity and, and has another positive number associated with it such that <clears throat> altogether you get a null vector. And so we think about currents that live on the null cone and they have some labels. Um, I wanted them to have a spin label um, to be spinners. The, the Lorentz group acts on the null cone in an obvious way. So the, the Lorentz currents are not part of this algebra. The Lorentz currents are um, they're the conformal group of, of null infinity. And in this null cone picture, they're just the invariance group of the null cone. Okay. So I want to talk about currents that can describe um, uh, the uh, flow of quantum numbers out. And I'm going to label those by a spin quantum number so that I can talk about spin a half particles. I think you can argue that this couldn't be bigger than a half, but I don't want to bother with that. Um, it's, I think, related to the Coleman-Mandula theorem. Um, and then there's some other finite set of labels P, which I'll explain in a moment. And they have this algebra Q beta of Q and little q. That's a capital P and a little p? It's a capital P and a little p. And I know that's awkward, but there's a reason that I'm doing that. OK, so there's some operator ZPQ in general. And um, there's gamma mu alpha beta m mu of p and q times delta of p dot q. And this is, roughly speaking, except for this generalization to include extra labels, this is the super BMS algebra of Awada, Gibbons, and Shaw, except I don't think it's in a form that was actually written in their paper. They wrote it in terms of differential operators on null infinity. And I've gone to the spectrum of those operators rather than differential operators on null infinity. M mu, M -mu is the following. P dot Q is equal to 0 if there's a right-hand side. And in that case, P and Q are parallel null vectors, and one of them is smaller than the other in size. Okay, M mu is the smaller of the two. Okay, so that the zero momentum things commute, anti-commute with everything. Okay. Um, and so I, I'm not going to go over the story of how this algebra is related to scattering, though I think it's really interesting and it, to a large extent, has not been worked out. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it. About it. Um, and what I want to do now is to ask how I can back off from this and get a finite dimensional algebra to describe a finite causal diamond. Okay. So one of the properties that this algebra has is that p slash uh, 
times q of p and little p, and this is capital P slash, is equal to zero. And what that says is that for each null direction on this null cone, q is a null plane spinner for that null direction. In other words, it lives in the spinner bundle over the transverse uh, space to the null direction. Okay? So that's what I'm going to generalize. I'm going to have the operators associated with the um, with a finite causal diamond live on the holographic screen of that diamond, which that's the transverse space, and they're going to be spinners over that space. Okay, that space is a compact Euclidean manifold. Okay, and there's a nice way to think about cutoffs on the spectrum of these operators, on the set of these operators. <laughs> Namely, when I think about them as spinners over the holographic screen, the spinner bundle over the holographic screen has an infinite number of independent elements. So that has to be thrown away in some way. You have to cut it off if you're going to satisfy the holographic principle. And what we decided to do was to think about space time such that the time like geodesics had SO3 in four dimensions in variance, SO d minus one in more general dimensions. And um, you can cut things off there by just cutting off the spherical harmonic expansion in a way that's rotation invariant. But there's there's why you want direct spinners instead of uh, chiral spinners here. Um, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. So these extra labels could I for four dimensions I could have chosen chiral spinners, and I often write it that way. And then that has to do the question you asked has to do with whether these extra labels correspond to a multiplicity of chiral spinners or not. So it's sort of included. I sh perhaps should write it. One of the reasons I wrote it this way is. You know, chirality properties depend on the dimension. So if I tried to write it, it would be different in two dimensions than in three, than in four, than in seven. And I, I just didn't want to. Why do you want these extra labels? What's their role? You'll see in a minute. You'll see in Sorry, just a second. How am I meant to understand? The data labels are, I, I'm still not quite understanding what the category is here. So the P's and Q's are meant to be momenta? Or the capital P's and capital Q's are null. They live on the null cone that I drew over here. But so P squared code, equals Q squared equals zero. And little p and little q are just discrete labels. Okay. Okay. And, and, and why do the... So, so, so you're thinking of this as... Um, so, sorry, these are, these are meant to be acting on a, a, a FOX space of functions, you know, initial data functions on the light cone, or? So when I- I'm the P's and Q's. Yeah, so what I, what I discussed on, in, no, no. So- okay, You're not thinking about initial characteristic data on the light cone. I'm, I am thinking about um, data. I'm not thinking classically, and I'm also not thinking in terms of particles. I'm thinking about how much of each kind of conserved quantum number or anything else that labels the possible particle species in my model flows out in a certain direction in null infinity, okay? And the Qs are the generators of the algebra of those currents, okay? But the capital Ps and the capital Qs, these null vectors, I, I, am I thinking of them as Position vectors on the light cone, or am I thinking of them as momentum? They're momenta on their momentum space light cone. So if I think about null infinity in the usual way, like this, at every finite point in null infinity, there's a unique outgoing p, mm -hmm. okay, up to a scale. Right. That's what this p is. The backward light cone is past null infinity. The forward light cone is future null infinity. 
things having to do with space like infinity get mapped into p equals zero by mm -hmm. this by this map and um, uh, there's an interesting story about time like infinity but let me not say it <laughs> um, it's it's uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting, but I, I don't want to uh, stop my momentum at this time. So what I was talking about was how to cut this off, and I said the way to do it in a rotationally invariant way is just cut off the spherical harmonic expansion. But you can say that in a much more general way that applies to any holographic screen. So the two-sphere, or the the D minus two sphere has on it a Euclidean Dirac operator. And because it's a compact manifold, that operator has a discrete spectrum that goes from minus infinity to infinity. And so any cutoff on the spectrum of the Dirac operator will give rise to a finite number of variables. So I just say I don't let the spectrum of the Dirac operator go off to infinity, I'm going to cut it off in some way. This is a way to construct a fuzzy version of the geometry. Fuzzy geometry in general, one thinks about by taking, people usually think about the algebra of functions on some compact manifold and replacing it by the uh, some finite set from some appropriately chosen basis of functions. What we're doing here instead, instead of thinking of the space of functions, we're thinking of a particular bundle over the manifold, the spinner bundle. So that kind of builds in the idea that we expect it to be a Riemannian manifold. And um, we are, we're cutting off the Dirac operator to define the fuzziness. And that defines then a fuzzy set of functions um, and it's, it's something that's been done, for example, people have done things like this um, for uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds using line bundles over the Calabi-Yau manifold rather than, um, than the spinner bundle. So it's not a terribly new idea from that point of view. It's just one that has not become popularized. So if I if so this is a this is a version of the fuzzy sphere and it must be in the literature of non-commutative geometry this particular construction you're using of things. Well people like to use the Dirac operator to define the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is completely understood. People, as far as I know, always define the fuzzy sphere in terms of cutting off the algebra of functions. But then there's a Dirac operator associated with that fuzzy sphere, and it does precisely what you expect it to do here. What happens when you do this cutoff is that these Qs go into, in four dimensions, psi A alpha, where this has n and n plus 1 components, and its conjugate, psi dagger, B, J, where this is an n by n plus 1 matrix, this is an n plus 1 by n matrix, and that's the standard construction of the two chiral spinner bundles over the fuzzy two-sphere. Okay? You replace them by the, the um, module of rectangular matrices of this dimension, and you can see that by counting spherical harmonics very simply, because what happens when I do this is I get every spin, think of this as the n-dimensional representation of SU2, and this is the n plus one-dimensional representation. I get every spin between a half and a maximum equal to n minus a half by doing this. And so the... Uh, um, the construction here gives precisely the standard definition of the spinner bundle. An advantage that this has over the traditional way of trying to talk about fuzzy spheres is if you talk about fuzzy spheres in terms of Kähler structures or symplectic structures on the manifold, you break rotation invariance in every dimension above two. This construction through the Dirac operator preserves rotation invariance because the Dirac operator does. And there are other interesting things that the Dirac operator encodes in it, 
For example, it encodes zero modes on a compact manifold, which we know from string theory are associated with preserving supersymmetry in the compactification. So now I can finally tell you what these little labels P and Q are. I'm imagining that my d-dimensional space came out of a higher dimensional theory with some compact manifold and P and Q label the, those elements of the spinner bundle on that compact manifold that I keep in my fuzzification of the compact manifold. And the holographic principle tells me I always have to take compact manifolds that have a finite size in higher dimensional Planck units and cut their spectrum off so that there are only a finite number of Dirac eigenmodes, because otherwise I'd have too many degrees of freedom. So I can basically rewrite this algebra in this cutoff um, system. Now, the one thing that disappears when you do it is P disappears completely, okay? When you write the algebra, the overall size of the momentum disappears completely, and I'm not going to explain it today, but at the end of the day, it gets replaced by the size of the matrices. Okay. Should so, I, should I think of little p's and little q's as um, the glue to Klein moment? Uh, or? Well, that's why I labeled them the way I did. Yeah. So if I think about a torus, if I wanted it to compactify on a torus that had, you know, some number of Planck lengths around this circle and some number of Planck lengths around that, I would do that by keeping a certain number of momentum modes in the Dirac equation, okay? But then you get to massive, well, in the you know, non-compact dimensions, you get to massive reps, of course. Yes. So, and, but I thought, isn't this an intrinsically massive? No, model? it's not. Okay. okay, so that was the thing when I, when I evaded talking about time-like infinity when I was talking to Lionel. Yeah. One of the things that is, kind of obvious, um, if I think about a finite causal diamond and a time-like trajectory, time-like trajectory goes through a finite causal diamond. It only goes up to a point up here because we take this silly limit, it's not silly, but we take this limit and take things to, now there's a way to describe that in terms of currents. If I think about momentum flowing through that finite causal diamond, the difference between a massive and a massless particle is a massless particle only has outgoing momentum and the massive one has momentum at this point on the sphere. It's got momentum that's going in the conjugate null direction. So if I work in terms of the momentum cone rather than null infinity explicitly, I can incorporate massive particles by double covering the momentum cone. So each point on the momentum cone has both the outgoing P and the incoming P, okay? And then the, one of the things that I um, was trying to do with a student and had not yet succeeded in doing is to write down formulas that would reproduce the Kaluza-Klein mass formulas for the torus using those ideas. And that's, that's another area that I haven't published on because I haven't figured out how to do it. Okay. Now the other thing that I want to emphasize about this idea that I just told you about is that it's a generalization that you all, of something that you all know and love. Namely the UVIR connection of ADS-CFT because what it's saying is that I have some D minus two dimensional manifold. Let's ignore the compact dimensions. Um, there, I have some D minus two dimensional manifold that I make large by adding more and more modes of the complete set of functions on that manifold. And so what I'm doing on that manifold is I'm able to uh, see smaller and smaller distances on the manifold on the boundary as I go out to infinity in bulk space time. 
And that's the UVIR connection. That, you know, in the ADS-CFT, we know that pushing down into the infrared is somehow probing the local structure in the bulk. And this, I believe, is a much more explicit version of that connection. And um, what I would hope to be able to do in the ADS case and have not yet done is to very explicitly um, map out the, the corresponding causal diamonds for a sequence that approaches the boundary in ADS space by looking at cutoffs on the angular momentum on the sphere. Okay. How much more time should I talk? Well, uh, a reasonable target would be what? At least by I have no idea what time it is. I don't have a watch. Oh, it's 12.10 now, and a reasonable target might be like 12.30 before you know, okay. people probably get worn out. Right. Certainly after that. I'm right. Okay. So um, uh, let me think about whether I should stop right now, actually. Um, Okay. Oh yeah. Let me just tell you. Yeah. Let me let me just say two words more about these variables. And um, if I do, so I told you what these spinners look like in two dimensions. What happens if I do d minus two dimensional boundary spheres? Then there's, you, you go look in the literature at the spectrum of the Dirac equation, and you find something interesting that if you put an eigenvalue cutoff on the Dirac equation on the d minus 2 sphere, then the set of spinners that you keep, the set of eigenspinners that you keep, have the following structure. They have an explicit spinner index because we're in more than two dimensions, so the spinner representations, there are no one-dimensional spinner representations. And then they have I1, ID minus 2, okay, where this is totally anti-symmetric under interchange of the indices, okay? So it has kind of the structure of a D minus 2 dimensional volume. And that, it, the counting, the rough counting should not surprise you very much because if I'm looking at very high values of the cutoff, so these I1, okay, and if you pick that one to be the smallest one, then, then the other ones go up by one. Um, the, the, the rough counting, the scaling, with n and d is something you should expect. Because if I think about any smooth manifold and I look at the very high eigenvalues of the Dirac equation, it looks like the Dirac equation in flat space, and then the spectral, spectral density goes like p to the d minus 2. Okay? That's true for any you know, simple differential operator. The Laplacian does the same thing. The very explicit anti-symmetric tensor form is special to the Dirac equation. And um, what you can do with these guys in any number of dimensions is you can make matrices M alpha beta. They depend on little p's and little q's. Um, and I and J, where I can track together two of these size or a psi and a psi dagger. Again, if you're going to higher dimensions, you have to make decisions about whether there's a reality constraint possible on the spinners or not. And the formulas don't look absolutely uniform. But morally speaking, what you do is you take um, J and then uh, I2, ID minus 2. So you can track together all of the indices but one on each of the spinners, and you make a matrix, okay, which is bilinear in the spinners, which is an n by n matrix. Okay? And what that is doing, if I think about these things as uh, little d minus 2 cubes, 
what it's doing is gluing things together on, on their multiple faces. I mean, you can't see it because you don't, I don't know how to see in D minus two dimensions, but leaving you know, one face left dangling okay, on, on either side. And those matrices, mo models like this with things that transformed under SUN, like anti-symmetric tensors like this, have been studied, and in particular models in which you take a Hamiltonian that's made up of polynomials in these matrices M with an appropriate coefficient. And these are, there's a whole theory of a Tuft scaling from, for tensor models of this type that's been developed in the, in the literature, which we use to a certain extent. Um, there's it will turn out, in order to make things work out correctly for gravity, the dependence of the order of this polynomial on n depends on what dimension you're in. So the, the order of this polynomial has to grow like n to the d minus 4. So it's finite in d equals 4 and grows in higher dimension um, in order to reproduce the, the proper long time behavior of black hole horizons. And, and, um, and then there's a, a coefficient out front, which I'll tell you about next time. So, Say again what this object is. Is there a missing equal sign between the M and the side? Yes, I'm sorry. And is the index? So MIJ equals this. These guys also have P. And Q indices. And the, and the I1 should be an I there? So it's the one that's. It should not be an I. I, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I was rushing. So, what I'm going to write down for you, for any of you who have the appetite to come another time, is a set of models based on these variables. The variables will have commutation relations that devolve from these. I mean, they're the kind of finite restriction of these variables, of these commutation relations. And you take those, you take that algebra, you have a bunch of variables, you write down a Hamiltonian, and I'll tell you how it behaves as a function of time in order to reproduce a lot of results that look like they're gravitational results. So I'll just end by saying that we have a whole class of very explicit models in which we claim the following things. We claim that first of all, we can identify in those models an asymptotically conserved quantum number called energy. Um, that that asymptotically conserved quantum number is carried by states that have, the, it, it's defined by restrictions on the states of these variables psi, where a whole bunch of these matrix elements of M have to be equal to zero. That makes a relationship between the energy of a state and the entropy of a state, which gives rise to just about all the thermal behavior you know for horizons. And in, in pictures, it corresponds to this restriction I told those of you who listened to my last lecture about the particles are defined by jets of energy, and then there are all these other modes that carry energy less than any specified cutoff that you, you give, which have to be zero in an annulus surrounding the opening angles of the cones of the jets. That translated into matrix model language, that constraint says that there's a basis in which these matrices M are block diagonal, and if I then make a Hamiltonian, which is single trace, the independent blocks don't interact with each other. And um, that, that leads to free particle behavior. It leads to particle interactions like this that can, um, when you impose our consistency conditions, they lead to Feynman diagram-like pictures like the one I drew over there, but it also has in it a process that looks very much like uh, black uh, 
whole formation and evaporation in which when you put too much of this quantum number energy into a small enough causal diamond, all of the degrees of freedom in that diamond become equilibrated with each other and then emit particles which are defined by these constraints in a thermal manner with all of the scaling behaviors of the onset of that threshold and what, how the temperature scales with the Schwarzschild radius, all of those things come out as matrix model results. Okay? And if you do the appropriate polynomials with the appropriate scaling of the coefficients, you also get the time scales for equilibration to behave as we believe black holes behave if the sakina suskind conjecture is true for the Hamiltonians that we write down. Much of this behavior is independent of the details of what these coefficients are. Um, and the, the big thing that's missing in these models is that our principles tell us that if I take two time-like trajectories that have a relative boost with respect to each other in Minkowski space, they should also have all kinds of overlap conditions and consistency of their dynamics. And you can show that in the limit of large causal diamonds, that leads to Lorentz invariance of the S matrix. But we don't yet have that constraint implemented, and it's, very, it's a lot harder than the constraints we have implemented. But a lot of things that you'd like to be true are true, unitarity, approximate locality of interactions, and so on. So anybody who wants to hear about the rest of it, we'll have to set up another time. Thanks. It's informal, I don't think we should.